One of the stars, Diego Calvo. Another of the stars, Margot Robbie. The guy some of you might not have heard of, but has a great career ahead of him, Brad Pitt. The really extraordinary Gene Smart. Jovan Adepo. The, the truly remarkable Lee Jung Lee. And last but absolutely by no means least, Cody the Wire. work. There is so much to talk to you about. We've got about 30 minutes. I, I don't even know where to begin, but I actually want to start at the beginning. And I think, Damien, that you first started thinking about this idea 15 years ago. Uh, what was the idea and how did it change over time? Uh, well, the, the, <clears throat> I think the initial germ of it was, uh, you know, I, I've been a fan of film history for uh, for quite some time, and I think uh, especially getting to know sort of the particulars of this sort of early, almost prehistory of Hollywood, the, the sort of the American film industry, Los Angeles as a city. Um, I remember one moment in particular that, you know, sometime around 15 years ago probably that sort of set me on the road was uh, reading about this kind of weird phenomenon where towards the end of the 20s, there was this sort of rash of uh, suicides, uh, uh, deaths that seemed that they could have been suicidal, drug overdoses, it was a little, little bit uh, uh, coalescing with the sort of uh, cresting of a drug, uh, kind of drug epidemic um, uh, going on at the time. And you know, I, I started to kind of dig into it a little bit, was a little curious as to why exactly that might have been the case, and you know, found it coincided with a transition that um, you know, I'd sort of seen treated in movies like Sing in the Rain and whatnot, which was namely the transition from silent to sound. Um, but it gave it this kind of brutal face to it that I was not used to. It gave it this sort of, uh, um, yeah, just kind of more of a glare that um, cast everything I, I sort of had thought about that year in a different light. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly looking at kind of the types of behaviors that would lead to those sort of outcomes, the kind of extreme living, the kind of passion, ambition, recklessness, unbridledness of all sort of stripes that characterized Hollywood at that time, and that just started my kind of, started my brain going. What was the hardest part about writing the script? Uh, well, I mean, event eventually it became kind of corralling it into, you know, into, uh, into the, the, you know, the sort of matrix of, of, of things that I really um, wanted to focus on. Because at the end of the day, you know, there's, it's such a sort of vast panorama, um, and, uh, you know, Ultimately, it became this sort of idea of it's going to be an ensemble piece. It's going to be anchored by a certain number of characters who are going to guide us through, um, uh, guide us through this tumultuous time, especially guide us through the basically the end of an era. You know, uh, the sort of passage from one era to another, um, and uh, you know, um, it had to become a human story ultimately. You know, I wanted to kind of use a, a gallery of human beings to sort of refract on a wider social change that was going on at the time that just fascinated me. But I think the, the challenge became sort of how to kind of distill it down to, to that gallery of characters. And then, of course, that's a challenge that winds up being a baton passed to the acting. I think um, at some point you had a four-hour-plus movie. Um, <laughs> I think your wife just told me, um, who's also the producer and plays the director, just incredibly well cast, you know? Yeah. Um, well, well, you know the William Goldman line, you have to sacrifice your darlings. What did you lose? Uh, 
I mean, the, I think each of the actors here probably has uh, um, specific instances in their head of, you know, it, it was, uh, yeah, it was definitely a fresco of, a, yeah, yeah. of a, it was a big meal of a screenplay. You had a whole walk in Mexico? We had a whole trip to Mexico. Did you? Yeah. It's gone. Yeah, there was a, a giant food fight. There was a spaghetti fight. Gene was fight? Me up. Yeah. 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 The food fight, I missed the food fight. Yeah, that's Steve's stuff. Yeah, poor, poor Gene. We had we had this scene that we, uh, you'd think it wouldn't have been the hardest scene in the movie with the battle scenes and all this stuff, but this was the hardest scene in the movie was this food fight of marinara sauce that <laughs> uh, took place at Mar Margot Robbie's character's house. And Gene was playing uh, Eleanor, uh, who's coming there to kind of write a sort of puff piece. And uh, some uh, kind of ex-boyfriends of Nellie's show up, and they get angry, and they start throwing food. And But we had to kind of, it's one of those things where it's, we had to sort of shoot every angle of it before shooting Jean because her costumes were not things that you could, we didn't have doubles of these, of a lot of these oh, costumes. No, really? so you can't just throw marinara sauce in it. <laughs> It's a whole thing, wow. and then, um, so we had this. Gene and I were just remembering. We had this poor, you know, this poor special effects guy who it all reside. You know, it was all riding on him to just hold this marinara and get ready and just aim. And you aim exactly right. And, uh, and okay. we, we went right way over that day too. I think. I was surprised how much stayed in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I. <laughs> The script was 180 pages. Wow. You know, it's hard enough to get 120 pages into shoehorn that into a film. And my first question to Damien was, great, great, great. What's going to get cut? <laughs> and he said, nothing. I'm going to pace this thing a minute a page. And it pretty much turned out that way, i got to say, to Damien's credit. Do you remember your first conversation with him, Brad, and, and what was that, where you met, what that was about? Uh huh. You remember? <laughs> well, I said, "Are you sure?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, I remember. Yeah, you had some concerns of. Uh, I was trying to sell you on some of my other. <laughs> <laughs> what was the conversation? I mean, did you had you read the script when you met? Was it, "Hey, hey, Brown, I'd like you to do this"? Well, I've been, you know, ever since Whiplash. Of course. Um, yeah, no, no Damien stood out as, as an original voice and, and, and um, the guy was going to be around a while. And so I was pretty thrilled when, uh, uh, to get the call. And then um, I read the script and it's just, you saw, it's, it's mayhem. And, um, and really well grounded and so i think our first conversations were just really about the period and understanding the period in the wild wild west i had kind of dismissed that era I hadn't really paid attention to it because it's not an acting style i relate to it's not what we gravitate to now it's very big they had to um communicate because they don't have language of course they had to communicate with the face it really was <laughs> and it wasn't until I, I sat down and saw some of the films that Damien some urging that you find the real charm in him and, mm -hmm. and, and the warmth in him. Which films did he get you to watch? Well, we, you know, we, a lot of, of course, John Gilbert and some Fairbanks and um, Valentino, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. But I was, we had a lot of conversations about Joan of Arc. I, it's so beautifully shot. Yes, coffee to try. Did did a lot of these characters are based on real life people? For, for all of you, um, who did you draw on? Uh, Hedda Hopper or Luella Parsons? <laughs> yes, she was a little bit um, beforehand, but yeah. Don't, don't sorry, sorry, the sorry, mic. sorry. Yes. yes. <laughs> My first time holding a microphone. Um, <laughs> well, Hedda was a little, a little later, but, but sure. I mean, Eleanor is kind of, you know, they're, everybody's like doesn't really like her and is a little bit afraid of her, but they're nice to her because she kind of has the power to make or break careers a little bit and so she's invited to all the parties and you know she just sits back and watches everybody go insane and writes her column yeah. how did you go about preparing for the role and were you doing it at the same time as hacks uh, uh no not at the same time no it was a little bit after I had a couple months i think the summer i guess i had the summer you know before we started and, and i had a wonderful 
dialect coach named Suzanne Solby and, and these unbelievable costumes and they brought in a milliner to make me all these great hats. It was great, great fun. Did you read a lot about the era? I did, and I and I read uh, about some women who were early screenwriters that n nobody has really known much about, and things like that. And it was yeah, it was fun. Marco, how much was this based on Clara Bow? I mean, I I think in a lot of cases for our characters, a lot of it is based on real people or an amalgamation of an, a number of real people, and I think the. That's definitely the case for Nelly, um, and I would say, that, I mean, Damien could probably tell you better because he wrote Nelly, but I'd say a lot of her is inspired on, uh, by Clara Bow, and I, I definitely found a lot of inspiration when I researched uh, Clara Bow, amongst other um, you know, people as well, but Clara was probably the biggest for me, yeah. Was it a difficult role for you? It was, I, like, the be like, I love her so much, but she... <laughs> She's so exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> she's just, do you like, take her home with you at night? She, yeah, she, no, she like t took everything from me. She like, I remember I'd written on the front of my script, like, demand their full attention, always. Like, demand their attention. And she, she did it to me. Like, she just demanded everything, like, physically and emotionally. And just like, I, I, by the end of the first week of shooting, I came home and I remember I said to my husband, I was like, this is the hardest I've ever worked. And he was like, what? You always work hard. I'm like, no, this movie is like, this is something else. And Damien, like my favorite thing about him amongst many is that he expects so much of you as an actor. We did our first take and I gave it a lot. Like I go big on the first take. And then I kind of, you know, director's like, all right, settle down a little bit. And then like somewhere around take four, they're like, yeah, we're good. Um, so I, you know, I know I go big on first takes and Damien comes up to me, twirling his hair as he does, you know, that thing that he's like, <laughs> which, which means that you haven't given him what he needs yet. So he came up and he's, and he's like, um, yeah, that was great, that was great. Uh, just need way more. <laughs> like, I was like, more than what I just did, and he's like, way more than that. <laughs> way, and I was like, holy shit, I don't, I don't know if I had more. That was kind of it. So that was, that was indicative of the entire experience, really, in my experience. Do you get scared now, to take on a role like that? I remember reading the script and being particularly terrified and excited by the whole thing, but I remember thinking, I mean, I know, you know when you like read a script and you're like, okay, I think I know how to do that. I kind of know how to do that, maybe. Oh, I don't know, I'll have to research that. It was the rattlesnake scene and the... And oh, the, I love that scene. The, the, throwing up scene, the throwing up scene. Those were two things where I was like... The, the audience here applauded. I, <laughs> really? I, I snuck in, you know, so... I was, I was like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do for that. I had no... I, even up until the night before, I was like, holy oh, shit, I don't, know what to, I don't know what to do in these scenes. It's just... It's so insane. It's, but, yeah, we... we we found it. I don't know, I guess you liked it, cool. <laughs> For all of you, what was the toughest moment? Um, Toby. <laughs> to Toby told me he was fine if I didn't ask him any questions. I said the orders would not be fine, so it's living proof. Um, the toughest moment, I, I would say, honestly, it was all a lot of fun, but I, like you, Margo, um, I think it was the first take I did, uh, it was the first take of the big scene that I did, and I just had so many nerves that I just kind of like exploded in the take, because I'd been, it's a long scene and a lot of lines, so I'd gone over it and over and over, and kind of as I was practicing the scene, I just did all kinds of weird stuff, because I didn't really know what the character was yet, and Damon and I were kind of building the char character on the go, so my first take, <laughs> Matt, Matt, Matt Pluff, who produced the film, uh, one, of, one of the producers of the film, he was like, you can go to a 16 here, <laughs> out, of, out of 10, go to, you know, you can, you can really stretch it out. I was like, okay. <laughs> and I just like, exploded in a ball of nerves and crazy weird expression that like was not, <laughs> coherent or consistent and right at the end of that take it was okay it's lunchtime <laughs> 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 that 
that was a, a good, <laughs> that was a really good, interesting, and weird lunch. <laughs> Did you eat? Yeah, yeah, I actually was fairly comfortable, and then I went, I think I'm gonna do that on every show I ever do, because <laughs> it just, like, like, all of the humiliation was done with. <laughs> Lulu, how about you? Um, and by the way, you were so extraordinary in this film. You know. What, what, what was the toughest part of you? <laughs> Sucking the venom out of my <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's just It was that so messy. <laughs> it was so messy. It was just, she had this thing that was stuck on her neck and it had honey in there. And we were in the desert and she's wearing just overalls and I'm wearing a silk dress and we're freezing. And we're both just shaking. And Damon's like in three layers under his can of the <laughs> and, and he's like, oh, are you guys cold? <laughs> and he's like, okay, um, can you, can you suck harder? I, and there's sand and grit and just you can use suck harder and then just really spit it and do it again and get really into it and it just wasn't good enough and that was not the challenge i thought i would face wow. going in the show this movie um yeah but that i mean yes that was the hardest part. were you nervous when you auditioned was it with damien was it with some of the other cast it was um i think i was one of the first ones to be cast oh. um it was right before COVID hit the oh. States. Um, I had auditioned around Christmas time, right after yeah. Christmas time. And then, yeah. um, I mean, when it came in my email, I was like, oh, mm -hmm. yes, <laughs> I have to. And then um, when I sent in my tape um, and Damien said that he wanted to meet me and I thought, I've been flying during COVID. Oh my gosh, it's gonna hit us. and. I wore a mask on the plane. Um, I Everyone looked at me like I was crazy. I met with Damien. We had about a 90 minute session. It was so great. It was, you know, uh, and I don't get that often when you come out of an audition and you feel like I really did everything I could. Um, I did my best work. And if that doesn't go, then I'm okay with that. I'm at peace with that. And then a week later, um, I got a little weird cold uh, after oh, coming back, no. but it didn't matter because I was driving when my team called and they said, um, you got it, and uh. I think I blacked out. <laughs> yes, <laughs> while driving. Javon, <laughs> <laughs> how about you? What was the toughest moment for you? The toughest thing for me was learning to play the trumpet. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> <Bye -bye. laughs> I did, I did what many actors do, they lie on their resume. <laughs> so, so when the, uh, the audition ticket came in, I was in Vancouver at the time, around the same time, like right before the pandemic hit the States. And my agent was like, you played the trumpet? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I, had, I played it briefly in middle school, but I hadn't really you know, been playing like, Mary had a little lamb at that time. And she was like, can you play like Justin Hurwitz type? And I was like, Ask that question later. It was just, it was just the audition, but it was, it was that was by far the hardest thing because I don't read music, I don't understand the notes or anything like that. So, they, you know, Damien was patient enough to uh, to say, "Hey, you got time? You have a few months. Figure it out." And so I, I met with my coach, Dan Fernero, who's a brilliant uh, trumpeter in his own right, and uh, they basically found a, a system for me not to give away too much movie magic, but uh, for me to learn the three valves in the trumpet and my coach would play all of the songs that we were playing like we heard the score months before anybody else heard it because we I, I, I remember actually sitting in the editor of you doing first man and justin was running in and out with new pieces of music yeah he's brilliant you know he's brilliant as he was pumping them out and you know he's still trying to figure out what the songs were going to be like i was like learning them and we would hop on zooms with damon he's like javon how, how are you uh how are you playing? And I'm like, yeah, it's good, it's going great. Just lying on my ass, right? Just like, it's not going well. But the scariest part about that before we even started filming was like, I went to go visit him when we were still trying to figure out like costumes and stuff. And my coach was like, yeah, he can actually play. And so I learned to play, um, what was the name of the song? 
think it's Mobet, like the actual song for the movie Mobet Blues with Denzel Washington, who also played the trumpet. And I played that song in front of him and the guy who actually played the music uh, for the movie. And I was like scared, I think I played it okay. Very well. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. You didn't say let's take the saxophone instead at this point. <laughs> so. No, well, trumpet is the one of the, I mean, you can speak to it, it's, it's I don't know, I'm a drummer, but I've always found trumpet to be, just from the outside, the hardest of, of the sort of jazz band mm -hmm. instruments. It's hard on your lips, it's hard on everything. Uh, it's a very physical instrument. Agreed. Gene, does it get easier or harder as you go along? Acting? Yeah. <laughs> Life. Life. Life, definitely. We, we can um, all comment about that. <laughs> oh, I... I, I, I guess in some ways it gets easier. I mean, you, you stop worrying so much about what other people are thinking and you do what mm. you think is is right. And, you know, I was thinking about what you just asked them and mm. that, that first tracking shot. Damien and I were just talking about that first tracking shot in that party with the chicken that's high on cocaine. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to get the chicken out. And that tracking shot went on forever with about 37 insane things happening in it, like people snorting coke off naked bodies and things. And you're thinking, I don't want to be the one to screw this up. <laughs> back to, to number one. But I remember we thinking, thank God we have some really uninhibited extras in Los Angeles. <laughs> I, 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 man, they were unreal. That's off to you guys. And I just remember thinking, okay, I'm looking around and I'm going, oh God, just don't look down and don't back out. <laughs> That's, you'll be fine. <laughs> I can't imagine you ever screwing up, do you? Oh, me? Or did you? Uh, sure, we all do, <laughs> of course. Thank you. Brad, what was the toughest part for you? Well, I can't even sing happy birthday, let alone opera. So I actually, just for those like two little verses, I think I worked about three months, <laughs> like three times a week, yeah. How do you prepare for a role like this? I, I mean, I don't have any, I don't, I don't have any formula. I mean, you just immerse yourself in the, in the world. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of talks with Damien. Um, uh, you just start feeling it. And just, it's, uh, to me, it's always been kind of something you, you kind of grope your way into and then it starts to fit and it starts to feel right. And, oh, that feels good. And that doesn't feel right. And you kind of, um, I don't know, it finds its pace that way. Um, is your script covered with notes? Do you work with an acting coach, or do you just go into everything intuitively? Oh, I've worked at times, um, like it was probably about 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I thought I was really hitting a wall, so I started all over again with an acting coach. Really? And, yeah, just to like start breaking it down again, and I just needed to, to like, to, to, I was getting too loose or something. Mm. And uh, that, that, that was really, really helpful. So I, it's something I would go back to, depending on the role, mm. certainly. What, what what did that coach change about the way you approached acting? Fuck if I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, I mean, I, again, I do find so much of it intuitive, but it was just going back to the, the basics, the A, B, and Cs, the breaking down a scene, you know, what are you after, what are you looking for, what, where are you coming from, you know, just the, the simple, you know, um, mm -hmm. strokes. Margo, what was the toughest for you? It's like the Mexican food fight. Um, the toughest, uh, like I said, I think just keep, you know, keeping up the, the, the level of energy and commitment, you know, at the end of the day or after doing dance sequences or whatever, or months into the shoot or, you know, whatever it was, just Nelly had to be like that every single second that she was on screen, so yeah, probably just keeping up the energy levels, you know. Was it hard to empathize with her? No. Um, I don't know what that says about me, but no. I, 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 <laughs> no, I felt, I, I think because I spent so long crafting her childhood in my mm -hmm. head, 
that anything could be justified in my mind. Anything. She could kill someone and I'd be like, I, she, I know where she's coming from though. Like, I, I just, I mean, she just, I know, I know I'm talking about a fictional character right now, but she had a horrible, horrible childhood. So she, uh, yeah. And so did Clara Bow, I think. And so, and, well, which was large, yeah, I took a lot of Clara Bow's, um, yeah, real life history, which is about as bad as a childhood anyone could have. So, um, yeah, it, yeah, once you kind of have that in your head, very easy to justify Nelly's actions. Diego, I think Damien spotted a photo of you. <laughs> This incredible photo is clearly uh, walk us through the first steps. How did you hear about it? And what happened? Um, no, they just sent me like a casting. Uh, <laughs> nobody said it was a dementia cell movie, of course. Uh, and then I sent a self tape, and then Damien called me. Hey, I'm dementia cell, super casual, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and we started like texting, and I sent like I think another video. And then COVID happened, so it was like a long process. But that was kind of useful, no? We had like a lot of time to, to work, but I don't know, Locked I think those. luck. Yeah. You saw a picture. <laughs> <laughs> was it difficult for you to take home a, a, a major role like that? And what did you find the most difficult? This. <laughs> <laughs> And it's going to get a lot worse. Uh, I hope no. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm very lucky. I, mean, I don't know. Uh, I mean, come on. <laughs> my life has changed a lot yeah. in the few years. I've been loving like a lot. I've been with my own body, with Rafi, with this man, with the other guy, with you, with all this. It's crazy. But I have to say, uh, it's all Damien, because Damien, and I, we worked a lot. He, he, he gave me the time to work in my English, for example, to work in my accent, to learn how to ride a horse, to have an acting coach, to rehearse. We, we rehearsed the whole movie in his backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Only like Olivia, Damien, and I. So I think it's a very uncommon kind of situation. I have a great, great, it's, it's, a, it's a very tight two hours version <laughs> of the movie, the entire movie on an iPhone in our backyard with Diego. And Olivia is playing all of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia playing like and Jack and Kelly. And every other role. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. And, uh, did you play any yeah, of the roles? Not quite as good, but you know. Diego Damien, 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 did you play any of the roles? I think sometimes when there's a scene with like three other people. Or the guns, remember? Right the, the effect of the... You know Damien's <laughs> in this movie. Oh, I, I, do, I did this, sound effects. There's heaps of, heaps of things where that's Damien's voice. Oh, wow. Yeah. Every time somebody's laughing of I can uh, hear it her character, it. it's Damien laugh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy, the guy's shit talking about Nelly, that's Damien. Yeah. <laughs> And, and the I, camera guy who calls out to his friend, he's like, hey, what's the difference? That's Damien off the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and this is you. You're, you're adding... No, I swear I've heard more. I think in the rough cut. I, I, Brad, you were going to say the four hours? I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, playing them, you're a good actor. <laughs> the four hour cut. I, I actually fought for to keep Damien outside the bathroom talking shit about me. <laughs> so spot on. Well, just to sort of wrap up, I want to come back to you and, and the preparation you did for this. And one of the things that fascinates is, is that you and Matt Plouffe, when you were talking about it, set up screenings of some of the great classic films. Which ones did you watch and why was that so important? Well, uh, you know, it was a little bit of a mix of um, movies from the era that we were trying to, you know, sort of uh, get under the hood a little bit of how exactly the kind of the kind of film industry that could lead to the making of something like, I mean, it's a little predates, predates this, uh, the era in this film a bit, but something like Intolerance, you know, something of that kind of scale or something like Storyheim's Greed, um, uh, you know, or Across the Pond, movies like Pandora's Box or Passion of Joan of Arc, you know, it's some of the sort of great masterpieces of the silent era that just, I, I think that's one of the tragedies in a way that uh, silent film got cut off basically right at its prime, you know? Um, and um, and so you feel then, hopefully you know, I tried to kind of convey that in the movie, you really feel that loss when uh, when uh, when that change comes in. Um, 
you know, and, and uh, I think otherwise, yeah, we would sort of cast a wide net, you know, just as, as I was sort of writing the script, as we were doing research over the, over the years, it sort of, you know, cobbling it together, you know, look at things like, uh, I mean, stuff you probably kind of, you can see the influences <laughs> in the film, you know, things like La Dolce Vita and, mm -hmm. um, you know, Nashville and, and, and movies of that ilk, but I think, um, but I think especially trying to capture the sort of the panoramic the sort of epic, larger than lifeness of that of that era, or at least the sort of what leapt out from the page when I was researching that era. That these were people who just gave everything to what they were doing, and that can result in uh, great art. Um, it can also it can also result in wrecked lives. It can result in a ton of collateral damage. Uh, you can say the same thing about any sort of technological change that the society goes through, that you feel this collateral damage that history, you know, brushes away, sort of wipes away, but actually looking at it with a microscope, you see the toll that it takes. So I think trying to just kind of give a sense of reality to, to that and to the enormity of that sort of requires painting a full picture of that society and then a full picture, ideally, of what happens when a wrecking ball comes to that society. Last question for all of you, has it, has it left you with a nostalgia for what Hollywood was, or, or the opposite? Hmm. Hmm. The same, no? <laughs> <laughs> Are you for right? <laughs> Toby, Eugene, what do you think? I thought that was a mic drop right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, the, the, the thing about movies, I was saying to somebody the other day, and it's true of a lot of industries, is that the people who started it, they were there because, not to get famous and get rich necessarily, but I mean because this was a new thing and they wanted to make movies and they came out to California. There was all this wide open space and you could shoot you know, anywhere and immediately then the, the industry eventually gets taken over by businessmen and lawyers and the priorities change, but the people who started it did it because it was like, oh my God, let's make a movie. This new thing that's been created and people would watch anything and they'd watch somebody, you know, getting on a trolley car, they'd watch a train come through the screen, they'd watch, you know, just seeing people on a screen was fascinating and now, now it's so, we're so kind of jaded is that we have to keep upping the ante to get the audience excited, you know? I think there's way less drugs now, too. <laughs> Sadly true. <laughs> On that note, I want to thank all of you. And if the audience, too, to stay for this. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.